tuning in. Our next presenter is Alvaro Ponzo of Ponzo Forms Corporation. Mr. Ponzo, you may begin. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining this presentation. My name is Alvaro Pombo. I'm the founder and CEO of Pronto Forms. As I say to everybody, I'm guilty of everything that goes around here. Uh, but uh, as you will see, it's, uh, it's been a great ride and uh, getting better every minute. Forward-looking statements, everybody knows these things, so I'll just table them there. By the way, all the numbers that we will be presenting uh, are all U.S. dollars. Um, so let's go with the first slide. Um, our company is based and is driven on uh, large, large customers. We started with a small, medium business, and uh, my background, I was a CIO of a very large uh, enterprise, as well as I worked for Exxon in field automation for many years. And I always kept uh, an ear down to what is that these large enterprises need. And my hypothesis on the base that I started the company uh, on um, has been proven actually quite well, which is great. So in the evolution of the company, I've been just uh, spending more and more time with those large enterprises, which now represent a large amount of our revenue. As you, would, as you will see, um, and as you can see already, uh, pretty steady ride, pretty steady compound uh, uh, annual growth, and um, happy to report on that, uh, and it continues. So let me walk you through um, what drives digital transformation in the field, okay? The first part that is driven is by people. There is a change in demographics and there is a higher demand for uh, technical expertise. I mean, things in the field, even though there is a lot of automation, it's not getting any easier, it's getting uh, uh, harder. And uh, not only that, but the demands for extracting a higher degree of efficiency in the field uh, it's definitely something um, that we see all the time. The next one is technology. Uh, everybody knows about the great advancements there. The next one is financial. People realized not that long ago uh, in some cases, but many companies have realized it from day one, that the gross margin or uh, in a large equipment in an elevator is not as big as on servicing it. And therefore, I mean, people have invested for many, many years in these field automations uh, and these uh, field organizations and extracting benefit out of it and more productivity is very important. Last one is customer expectations. We all now have the Amazon expectation on everything. We want to know, we want to see what's happening on every single step of uh, any interaction with a customer. So basically what's happening, I mean, it's all these these four uh, elements have created an increased demand on field automation across the board. Now, uh, the elephant in the room is, has always, I mean, has been for the last uh, nine months or whatever number of months is COVID, and COVID has done something very interesting uh, to our space. I mean, there has been a secular change of enterprises now not only being more aware of the importance of those frontline workers and first-line workers, but also there is liability related to it, plus there is a lot of changes. I mean, there are now field people as they go into a uh, hospital to maintain one of those MRIs. Uh, they have to change and they have to adhere to so many different protocols and a variety of changes that constantly happens. So the next uh, part of the story is we've been close to Gardner, uh, and to be perfectly honest, I mean, what we do, which is ultimately enabling companies to automate their field workflows or to enhance their field workflows in an easy and simple way, there is no such a category within Gardner, okay? So the closest to what we do is what they call uh, LCAP, low-code application platforms. And LCAP is really the way we do it. And why do we need why do we do it this way? Is ultimately imagine if you're trying to automate a set of people in the field. And I mean, there are not enough Java developers right now, not even in San Francisco. Imagine finding a guy to go and work with a field organization somewhere in the boonies, literally, okay? 
and trying to create that automation, or in, for that matter, IT. I mean, IT does not have a good reach into the field. So the way we deliver that automation is by enabling those people at the edge of it, we call them citizen developers, to create and build on top of our platform. And that platform had to be, since day one, an LCAP, carry, uh, an LCAP uh, platform. So we happily enjoy some very good positions in those quadrants, but we are not into being an LCAP platform. We are into being the best and simplest and more effective platform to help the frontline work. And as you would see in the next slide, this frontline worker platform has five key components. First of all, for that person in the middle, that feel uh, guy or gal, for them, they live their life in trying to be more effective and trying to stay safe. Those are the two components for these people. Now, how can a platform enhance those two pieces? Number one is through workflow enablement, and that's what I've been talking about, okay, which is making the tasks out there easier. That gets represented ultimately in a tablet or whatever device they have, and those workflows are the workflow instructions, are the installation procedures, are all sorts of different things that happen are very frontline driven. Now, the challenges of being in the front line is that there is no connectivity sometimes. There is a lot of importance is driven by the context of this individual. These are individuals that are unlike us on the phone. I mean, they're in the edge of the organization and they like to be there. They like to be climbing a pole. They like to be out there doing those things. So the next element is how do you enable them to be safe and healthy, okay? And from the perspective of that, we enable procedures, checklists, uh, we report location, activities, et cetera. The next element of it is you have to train these people and make sure they're compliant with what they do. And part of our platform enables that. The last part is collaboration that we now all as remote workers understand very well what these people require, but it's a different kind of collaboration. They're not sitting on a desk talking to people. I mean, it's very contextual and knowing in which part of the of the workflow you are and sharing that workflow with the person behind the scenes in, that you're collaborating with is very important. Last but not least, this is all about data and ultimately reporting on frontline people data is very important. You can find efficiencies. You can see that in certain countries, some people perform the workflow in a different way. Which one does it better, safer, healthier, and more effective? And that's what the platform delivers. So if I take you um, through uh, the next piece is some examples. I mean, we have Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, they use us um, for gas uh, metering inspections after a big uh, uh, problem that occurred in San Bruno. Uh, we were brought into uh, enabling many people to do inspections of gas uh, meters and uh, making sure to the regulator and for themselves, okay, that uh, what they were that they were not overlooking any piece. The same with some of the wildfires that occurred. Johnson Control, I mean, controls they use us in several business processes, many of them throughout the world. And um, again, this is about enabling a large enterprise that has many of these workflows to do them easier and consistently throughout multiple geographies and extending their efficiency and safety of their people. Another example, Philips Healthcare. I mean, they use us as they deploy those MRIs uh, and multiple, I mean, different type of machinery into hospitals. I mean, configuring and installing an MRI is not an easy task. It's a team of people doing it. And uh, they required, I mean, throughout the fine tuning of an MRI, there is a lot of thresholds that have to be, I mean, looked after, and there is a compliance element. I mean, if you leave one of those machines in the wrong situation, people could die, and that's not a small uh, matter for people like uh, Philips. So, in summary, I mean, what do we do? Enabling those people at the edge of the organization and their, and, and their managers 
an analyst next to them to improve those workflows because those workflows change constantly, and we do that easily, efficiently, and cost-effectively. So in terms of customers that we have, we have about 140 of these very large enterprises. Uh, there is about 2,500 customers. Uh, uh, and ultimately, what we're producing these days is about 2.7 million forms a month that translate about a, a form is processed in our system uh, every single second. Now, a form, people will think about, oh, my God, it's a big piece of eight and a half by 11. No, it's a set of questions and answers. They're like mini apps, if you want to describe them like that. Forms is a, I mean, term that we came from the past, and uh, anyway, has been probably not, doesn't necessarily describe in the best possible way what the world looks like right now. So let me walk you through the model uh, and the financial model of the company. We have a high growth subscription uh, model, entirely SaaS. I'll talk about that in a second. Operating leverage, strong gross margins uh, in the 80s and sometimes touching the, the 90s at who has, that has enabled our company to have a proven model, scalable model, and grow in a very sustained, uh, sustainable way. And last but not least, we're self-sustaining from a cash perspective, and I'll talk about that uh, in a second as well. So let's just go through the high growth uh, story. So the majority, vast majority of this revenue is all recurrent revenue, and it's all subscription revenue, okay? And it comes from per user per month subscriptions. We have I mean, some customers that have many, I mean, hundreds or thousands of users, and in some cases they say, hey, we have a subcontractor that is not using it all the time. Can we have a different pricing model? So in some cases we accommodate a uh, slightly different framework, but it's all revenue driven by per user per month, multi-year contracts now, and it has been evolving in a great way, as you can see, quarter over quarter growths and, um, and uh, all the pieces. So you can see here a little bit of the impact of COVID at the beginning of the uh, in Q1. I mean, that translated obviously into a revenue of Q2. Um, if you look at the impact of COVID for our organization, we had some large customers that suffered. I mean, we had some airlines that suffered. Uh, but overall, I mean, it's been a steady uh, uh, growth at a different pace. I mean, I cannot say that we're going at exactly the same pace. However, it's very strong and continues to be, as I said, because of the demand for it. Uh, it is there without uh, uh, questioning our mind about it. So I go to the next slide and um, I talk about that base and that base that we're very proud of, 39% of these base is now enterprise. We started in the small medium businesses with people that required literally forms to enable billing. And now we're into a very different world of these multinational companies that requires hundreds in, in some cases, um, even thousand, low thousand uh, workflows. Uh, that are maintained by, uh, by our platform. So quarter over quarter growth, very healthy, and uh, the ARR base, uh, it's uh, getting very, uh, very healthy, and the vast majority of it enterprise and growing. And uh, the growth of that enterprises, of those enterprises, uh, I mean, you can see here the unit economics of it, and we're describing it then by how much of it is uh, the recurring base as well as the expansion. The expansion is very healthy. We look at the large customers as customers that are that either have 2,500 employees, okay, and within those we also look at customers that have more than $100,000 of ARR. And you can see the composition, and you can see the unit economics of these um, of these uh, uh, cohorts, okay, as well as the I mean the segment uh, that we're focusing on, and they're very healthy. I also want to share with you how one of those enterprises expand. And this is the case of a company that started in this in the U.S. Um, very large brand that everybody will recognize. It started with the U.S. with a small asset inspection in an area of North America. Very quickly, an accident occurred in Hong Kong that they basically said, "Hey, you know what? We should definitely apply the same techniques," and we ended up selling into Hong Kong um, a couple of uh, instances. And right after that, North America decided to adopt this product across the U.S. 
and uh, that was uh, very good. Then we started to expand in some other places in Japan and other geographies. Then, as you can see, there is more expansion to this initial contract. And as it evolved, we're now even expanding even further. Uh, and we believe we are more or less in that particular enterprise at about 25% of the penetration. The way we look at these uh, penetrations and the way we look at the, at the, at the base, uh, I mean, at the potential of an enterprise, enterprises, if they're field related, they usually have about 40 to 50% of their people in a uh, field position uh, when they're totally field centric. When they're not, it's about 30%. And we believe that a third of those people uh, use frontal forms or could use frontal forms easily. So the market is very big. I mean, the market is, uh, is uh, fortunately uh, very large and expanding, which is the good news. So I, we took an approach here to show you how, did it, how long did it use to take to take, to take a customer from their initial purchase to a customer adding more than $100,000 of MRR, okay? And then after that, they keep on evolving. And basically, I mean, the message here is these large customers, I mean, the sales cycle is getting shorter. They're getting to that sweet spot of, of adoption faster. It's getting better. And not only that, they continue after that, which is uh, an important part of the story. So I'll go to the next element of this conversation, which is the operating leverage. Uh, you can clearly see there that uh, the majority of the spend that we have is in sales or marketing, and we're going to continue to keep it like that. Uh, we are, I mean, we currently generate uh, some losses, and we want to, uh, I mean, the losses are in the range of three hundred to $800,000 a quarter. We currently have cash in the bank uh, at about uh, $7 million, and um, we believe that the play, the, the play here is a growth pay, and we believe that by deploying those resources aggressively on the sales and marketing side, uh, we're achieving some very good uh, rates of growth. Uh, and uh, the reality is the product is there, it works, as there is plenty of evidence there, so we don't have a major R&D spend ahead of us. However, the platform continues to, to, uh, to evolve, and uh, I mean, there is nothing easier to sell than a good product, and I believe we have a terrific one. And uh, we're steadily decreasing our uh, GNA spend, as you can see. So. As you can see, we've proven that operating leverage uh, that is uh, essential uh, for a company of our size, and it gives us that independence to continue to grow and direct our efforts to the right place without having to raise any other money or things like that. So um, the profitability profile, I'll leave it uh, in front of you to digest it. Uh, 2020, uh, year to date, 19% uh, growth. Uh, and uh, we don't provide uh, any guidance, but we definitely have a very good feeling about where the market is for our product. Uh, and we believe that uh, the growth uh, and the motions that we have in place to continue to accelerate that growth uh, are very good. The last part of the conversation here will be around um, I just get the management team. Uh, so, bit on my background, I already mentioned have a strong management team. Uh, we have a very strong culture in the company, and uh, we have a very good group of people that understand how the money is made, okay, and how the growth is uh, achieved. Uh, it's a company that is very down to earth. Uh, we don't have, uh, we never had a massive VC behind us that had put gazillions dollars on it. I mean, we've been really evolving by developing different muscles and operating them and just uh, getting to the right uh, balance. Uh, and uh, we have been deploying resources to that balance uh, in a very good way. Strong board as well uh, behind us. Uh, Terry Matthews, some of you might know it, is the chairman. We have uh, Phil Deck, uh, strong uh, uh, former CEO of two companies, uh, very good leadership and very good uh, board member. And we have uh, one former CEO of a couple of Canadian uh, high-tech companies, Erogonic, and uh, other independents with very strong 
uh, background in uh, what we do. I'm very helpful. Um, it is a strong board uh, governance for this company. Uh, we started very small, uh, being public, so it's probably way ahead of our size, but not in a bad way. I mean, there are no skeletons in the closet. There are very good way of managing the company, cadences for strategies, for things like that. Uh, very well run and, uh, and a good team uh, behind the scenes supporting that. The last part I want to summarize is uh, with regards to, uh, hold on, let me just go here. I clicked the wrong one. Is, I mean, the investment highlights. I believe we have a leading product in a growing mobile enterprise market. Um, I also believe that we have a predictable and growing recurrent revenue uh, approach, again, in a market that is humongous. Uh, and I believe uh, we're doing the right things to capitalize on it. Strong expansion from enterprise customers. I mean, the net retention rate of those customers is terrific. We're doing something very well there. And I think we're starting to understand every day more and more what we're doing so we can do more of it, uh, which is very good. The next uh, part of it is a cash flow annuity. I mean, from these uh, customers with a high retention rate. Uh, strong operating leverage. I mean, we have these multi-year contracts and we have these good margins uh, that give us an ability to not only have a, an operating leverage, but a predictable one. Uh, and it's staying in a, I mean, in, a, in a safe place to achieve very decent growth is the best uh, way to say it. And uh, I think we have a very strong technology. It's a young technology and a good go-to-market, as I said, to capitalize on it. So if I just uh, sum up, I leave uh, some of you, but I believe this presentation is there, available for consumption. I mean, start on the right-hand side, uh, going to 2020, and all the different considerations and net losses and incomes and operating cash flows, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions with regards to that. Uh, that's it. I, I am happy to answer any questions, and uh, thanks for listening to a story. Thank you, Alvaro. Uh, our first question asks, for clients of ours that are in the service sector, how are they able to measure uh, productivity improvements from implementing Pronto Forms? Um, good question. So look, I mean, the productivity improvements, uh, there are many of them. I mean, I, I, I remember a visit to, I'll give you two very quickly. I remember a visit to a very large, one of those very large customers, and we went to meet with their new CIO. And on the way there, the uh, person who was, uh, who's our champion in there says, hey, just want to brief you with uh, something that we found out. There was another way of doing this automation, uh, and they had a team of 50 people. And uh, his opening remarks to this meeting was what these 50 people, which were being cut down to be 20, uh, tried to achieve uh, in several years. Uh, they managed to automate like about two or three workflows. With Pronto Forms, they had enabled 15 of them, okay, in about a year and a half with two people at it. And why is that possible? And I was just sort of like saying, oh, my God, okay, yeah, stop selling, man. But no, the reality is that it's possible because it's in the hands of the right people to perform the automation. So that's a monstrous amount of productivity without even measuring the productivity gained by the automation. And the productivity gained by the automation is everywhere. I mean, these people are moving from paper processes to an electronic process without even getting into AIs or without getting into massive analysis of results or anything like that. So just the core basis of what we're trying to do, humongous productivity gains. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is about growth opportunities. So we are in a number of verticals, but are there maybe one or two uh, verticals that we're in or we will be entering that really excites you and maybe you could describe a little bit about the growth opportunities you see there. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, I said it uh, yesterday as part of this conference, there was an interview that I was part of the panel. And I said, look, the best thing about Pronto Forms, I've always said, is the size of the market, okay, and the opportunity in front of us. The worst thing about Pronto Forms is the same thing. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, we're a small company trying to 
grow into a big market. So you have to be extremely disciplined and extremely focused in when you're aiming those resources at. So we've done, I mean, all sorts of analysis, started with Gartner doing an analysis that yielded 13 different verticals. I mean, we cannot do anything for 13 verticals, okay? So we selected four, and the four that we focus on are heavy equipment manufacturers, okay, like the Conies, the Otis, all those guys. Number two is the medical equipment vendors. And we've done very well with the Philipses, with uh, many others, Alcons and others that are public and others that are non-public. Uh, why? I mean, what's the commonality between these two is they have very complex equipment that they need to maintain, serve, install, et cetera. And we shine on those two. So those two have plenty of growth, but there are other couple of ones, which is um, utilities. We do quite well, long sales cycle, but we do quite well on them. And uh, the last one is uh, in the oil and gas and in the mining industry. There is a lot of need for what we do. So between those four, we have plenty, okay? And we're prioritizing our resources to go after them in a very systematic way and in a very specialized way uh, to present to those verticals the right solutions. And we, and there, and we have tons of, of examples of those solutions. So we're just packaging them and aiming very, very tight to those opportunities. Great, thank you, Alvaro. Our next question asks, uh, what would you estimate the average penetration is of our existing uh, enterprise customers? I actually believe it's very small. I actually believe that, uh, that uh, I mean, there are some customers of those 140, which are now 164, actually, enterprises with more than 2,500 people. In some cases, we're in a little area of an organization. So trying to get to a full penetration on those enterprises, it's, it's, there are so many, there's, there are different motions that you have to implement. I mean, one of them is geographical expansion, as I as I saw, show you guys on some of those examples. However, the other one that is already starting to happen in, in, in some of those large ones is other use cases. So, I mean, I'm not Salesforce. I'm not a platform that everybody will say, oh my God, what a monstrous amount of ability that uh, people will buy, go and buy a frontline platform today, okay? The, goal, the way they, this happens is they go and bring a use case and it starts propagating on what we're doing, particularly this year, Last year, we put now some people in the company that are specialists in expansion, okay? So we're working on, I believe, as I said before, that a third of the field force is a very good number in any of those organizations. I mean, you're talking organizations of 80, 100,000 people. And if you do the math, I mean, it goes mind-boggling very quickly. And the good news is that we're present in 164 of those companies. Can I expand 164? I hope, okay? But the reality is that we don't need 164 monstrous expansion to double revenue or anything like it. Great, thank you. I believe that's all the time we have for today, so I will ask you to uh, close it up and then we can hand it back to the moderator. Thank you everybody for listening. appreciate your attention and uh, any other questions, let me know directly. And that concludes the webcast. Thank you.